welcome to Fusion Forum, the podcast, Nourishing Your Creative Soul, sponsored by Fusion Theater Company, Albuquerque's own professional producing theater company located in the land of enchantment. That would be the great state of New Mexico. So my guest today is Alex Squire. She might I think you probably fit into the category now of fusion family since Alex has been working with us since, oh, he was in high school and now he's entering his senior year at NYU's Tisch School for the Performing Arts. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Good. So you've been hanging out in New Mexico for a few weeks. That's right. I got back a few weeks ago from my the first half of my summer travels and I've been here just kind of recuperating for a little while, helping out some family members with some stuff. And how does it feel to be a senior in college? (laughs) On the one hand, it doesn't feel any different just because the cycle is kind of rinse, repeat, Uh, get back, get back to work, continue next summer, et cetera. But uh, on the other hand, knowing now that this is my last summer of limited responsibilities feels pretty great. I'm really excited to kind of get down to business. Right. But it's not exactly rinse and repeat because you are changing paths. You were focusing on acting and now you've decided to really focus on the area of directing. Why? Why the change? A couple of years ago, uh, an acting professor of mine said something that kind of struck a chord with me, but I pushed it to the back of my mind for a while. She said um, that If you want to be a creature on stage going through a journey from beginning to end through that lens, you want to be an actor. But if you want to tell a story holistically and create all elements of the world and explore the story that way, you should be a director. And I realized that the way that my brain works just lends itself more naturally to to that directing aspect. And I, I find myself having way more fun and being able to go that much deeper when I'm working on the outside, crafting the whole thing holistically rather than just from that one uh, point of view. Cool. So let me ask you this. I ask everybody this. Um, What was your childhood inspiration for theater? Was it a show? Was it an experience? What, What drew you to the land of theater? I started doing theater in first grade because my elementary school did not have an art program. So we would, on every Thursday, we would take a bus to a local middle school that did have an art program and borrow their facilities and teachers for the first half of every Thursday. And you could sign up for two classes. And I took a musical theater class my first grade year, and I really liked it. So I just kept doing the various theater classes they had. It wasn't really a, I don't have a show or a moment where I kind of realized that this was my entire life and it was an awakening it was more just kind of a steady progression of doing it more and more throughout the years and I eventually kind of realized I had to apply to college and figure out what I was going to do with my life and um, and I was sat backstage of my high school theater and I just kind of looked around and went oh yeah okay this now you've done a lot of technical work too right I mean what what's your sort of areas in which you've worked well I I did some starting in high school I started doing a lot of lighting and set work I learned some basics of sound and projections, but lighting and set was my sort of bread and butter. Um, And I did that pretty seriously for a few years. I still do that to this day, just more on the side. Um, And I have increased my knowledge of kind of sound and projections. But uh, as far as tech goes, I'm more mostly a lighting designer and lighting tech. Do you think that's going to help you as a director? I think so. I mean, ever, from everything I can tell, it seems that the more languages you speak and the more areas of theater you have, um, you have some proficiency and the easier it is to communicate with various parties and, and communicate your ideas effectively and get everybody on board and the same page. Uh, so I think that that'll actually make a big difference. So one of the things I've been very, very jealous of Being in New York and being in the school that you are, you've been able to take advantage of seeing a lot of theater in New York. So let me ask you, if you were to pick your top two shows that really inspired you and maybe even, I don't know, maybe even drove that decision to direct a little bit more, um, what would those be? Well, let me start with the two shows that I think were uh, the two shows that I was moved the most by. Uh, 
in my freshman year, I saw, I think it was my freshman year, I saw two shows, uh, both on Broadway, that really moved me. One was a uh, musical at the time that had just moved to Broadway called Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, which was uh, a piece of theater that pushed limits in so many different ways of, of, of how to tell a story and the methods it used to tell that story from the technical aspects to the storytelling itself um, that I found myself just head over heels in love with the show. And I saw it a few more times before it unfortunately closed very early on. Uh, the other show that I saw, which really inspired me was 1984, which moved to Broadway from the West end shortly after Trump was uh, elected president here in the U S um, for obvious reasons. And I, saw the production and was moved in a way that I did not think was possible. It, it, it was a production of theater that scared me and, and ter- it terrified me and the people around me and motivated me. And I remember at the end of the production, I don't think anybody clapped. I think everyone was sat there in horror at what they had seen and, and, and moved in a different way than the cathartic, normalcy that most theater kind of aims for and that inspired me to want to create very politically active theater that would start conversations to conversations and uh, enact change rather than giving an audience the gift of a cathartic finish and sort of button on their night interesting so did both shows have or did they both sort of go against what we would call a um, sort of traditional narrative structure? A little bit. Neither one deviated so much that it was completely illegible from what you would expect from a theatrical experience. But they definitely both took liberties in ways that they told the stories uh, from the technical elements, you know, breaking fourth wall, utilizing video, uh, set that interacted with the audience itself. Um, there were just lots of ways that it, it took its own little liberties, uh, but was still was grounded in kind of somewhat traditional theatrical elements. Great. We're going to take a little break. Welcome back to Fusion Forum, the podcast. I'm back with Alec Squires. We've been chatting a little bit. Alec is going into his senior year at NYU's School for the Performing Arts. That would be Tisch, School for the Performing Arts. And I know that you experienced an interesting training method that I think is almost um, sort of a regular occurrence now in training programs, but a lot of people who went to acting school, oh, in my era, for instance, didn't get this kind of training, Uh, the Suzuki method, right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. What, What is that about? Well, so uh, we had a class in the second year of training at my specific acting studio, the Atlantic Acting Studio, and we had a, uh, a teacher who goes by the name of Kelly Marr, who is one of the original members of the City Company, founded by Ann Bogart in New York. And she uh, was the first American woman to train with the Japanese theater director, Tadashi Suzuki. And so she is somewhat of an expert in the uh, Suzuki method. And so she is also Atlantic's um, Suzuki teacher. We spent three to four hours a week in class specifically doing this training. And then we take it outside with us to train on our own. And it's a very physically rigorous and strenuous method meant to simultaneously force your body to work to its limits and also free it up for the most liberated form of uh, physical usage on stage. So give us an example. I think there's like different types of walks and gestures and so forth. If you could just explain a little bit, maybe one or two of those. Yeah. So uh, there are, like you said, various ways of walking and marching and, and different ways of moving in general to encourage different body parts to be worked out and strained. Um, one is called basic three B. It's a very, it's hard to explain in words, but what it is initially is you, you bend your knees a little bit, you bring your feet together, you bend your knees and your upper body is meant to be loose, but upright. 
and your fists are closed as if they were holding two swords is the image that uh, Kelly gave us. And so your upper half is loose, but held up and your lower half is meant to be like the base of a statue, which is every muscle is totally engaged. And then you move forward across the stage by seeing something in the distance and you kick up one leg so that it is uh, at a 90 degree angle, both at your waist and at your knee, still fully engaged. You stomp it to the ground and then you slide with as much force as possible as if you were going through some thick mud and push that leg all the way forward. And now you have your back leg, you do the same thing with that leg where you bring it and kick it forward into that position, stomp down and slide that through the mud. And you do this crossing the space back and forth, back and forth. And it sounds kind of mechanical, but if you are focusing on something, your intention with whatever's across that you're seeing across the room uh, and you keep the form, it is incredibly demanding and uh, also very helpful to get a better sense of your body and how to really fully utilize your body on stage. You think you'd be able to use that as a director with your actors a bit? You could. I could. Uh, it's something that I think was a great teaching method and it's a great gift to give to someone if they want to use it on their own. I'm not sure how much I personally would want to impose it on my actors as part of the rehearsal process yeah, like yeah. Tadashi Suzuki <laughs> did and then the city company later did. Right. Um, but some some could. I'm not sure if I would want to, but you definitely could. So we talk a little bit about other things that nourish uh, an artist's soul, particularly a theater artist's soul. And I know that you are very passionate about photography. How did that come about? Ooh, how did it come about? I don't know for sure where it started. I know that I took a class when I was a, in middle school for a summer camp on film photography and I enjoyed it but after summer camp ended I dropped it again and then in my senior year of high school something happened and I knew my mom had an old camera lying around this one was digital and I kind of stole it uh, with her permission but I, she used it for fun and I just took it and I carried it with me everywhere really for the rest of my senior year I was just taking photos of anything and everything trying to understand the technical elements and also the artistic elements and I really fell in love with it so that by the end of my senior year I bought my own camera uh, and started shooting with that and then as I got better at it I kept growing you know my art form and my I eventually became a business and I started growing it a little, a little bit of a side business and I bought different cameras I learned more about the art form digital versus film more about photo editing composition and it's just become kind of a part of my life. I have a handful of cameras. I always have one or two on me. I'm always ready to whip it out and take a photo of something if I see something interesting happening in front of me. It's it's a part of my life and it's really fulfilling. And you just got back from several weeks in Europe and you brought your camera and it was primarily sort of a photography tour, right? Yeah. I, uh, I spent, the original plan was to spend six weeks in Paris. I speak French. Um, and I wanted to both work on my French and also take uh, photos of a city that I know is very aesthetically and culturally significant. Uh, so after planning for a while, I went out there at the beginning of the summer and I was there for four weeks and I had two more weeks before my flight out of Paris. And I decided that I also wanted to see some other cities. So I took trains to tour a couple of other cities, Marseille, Barcelona, Geneva, and I spent a few days living in hostels at all of these places uh, with nothing but really a duffel bag and my camera. And I spent my days wandering around eating food and taking photos of anything and everything I found interesting. So did you get a sense of sort of the vibe over there as far as being, uh, you know, a kid from the U.S.? Were you getting any kind of a vibe from people as far as what they might think of us right now, sort of a socio-political vibe at all? I did not because I was, I, I, it seems to me that I was actually able to disguise my status as a, an American citizen because my French is, um, I'm not fluent in the sense that I am, can be taken for a native, but enough people asked me if I was Belgian or Swiss that I think that they <laughs> thought that I, I was not American. Um, so I didn't get a lot of 
people questioning, oh, what's it like in America right now? What's, what right. are you doing? What's wrong with you? Like I have when I visited <laughs> other places in the past. Last summer, I was in England for a little bit and people were constantly asking me those kinds of questions. This time around, not so much. How many pictures did you end up with? A little under 4,000 oh raw God. images. How are you going to edit those down? What's well, your plan? I've, I've found the 400 ones that I think are worth editing and I'm slowly, slowly chugging my way through them. I've edited about 50 so far and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting a wall a bit because the editing process does drain on you. But for me, it's also a lot of fun kind of taking these images and making something spectacular in my mind out of them and, uh, and reliving the memories, even though it was only a few weeks ago, it's, it's still nice to kind of go back and say, oh yeah, I remember I was, you know, at the Basilica that day when it started to rain and I ran into this lovely couple or, oh, I was in the food market talking to all these you know different merchants so it's um it's a slow going process but i'm making my way through it and you have a goal of potentially coming out with a book right i'd like to turn them either i mean i'm using all the photos for my social media presence and to, for my website my portfolio but i'm hoping to get some kind of either book or magazine or self published something or other to use to get my work more widespread what do you think the relationship is between your photography and your work as a theater artist? Do you think that they go hand in hand? Are they really separate worlds for you? Does one feed the other? There are similarities and there are overlaps in the theory um, of what they are as art forms, which I don't always keep in mind, but I do occasionally use to um, work on one from the other. They both require knowledge of composition, the ability to be impulsive or to take your time and really be patient with something. Um, for me, I love street photography and portraiture. So there's always a human element in my photos. And so the ability to see something almost before it happens or as it's happening and really have the, the, the ability to capture it in that moment and in that instant to instant change, uh, that is something that I think overlaps with theater a lot. Tell me a little bit about the project that you're thinking of directing at school. It's a Tony Kushner play. Oh, this play. No, this one's actually Tony Kushner is um, the Tony Kushner play I'm, I'm reading right now is, is, is a very similar thematically, but not ah, the one that I'm okay. thinking about directing. Uh, there's a play that I have written a proposal for uh, to direct next this upcoming semester called The Pains of Youth by Ferdinand Bruckner. It is a um, German expressionist play written in 1927, I believe. Um, so obviously Weimar, Germany, before uh, the Third Reich came to power. It is about uh, six or seven young medical students, all in their early 20s, living in Vienna, who have somewhat lost their humanity and lost, start, started to lose their path and, of what it means to be a person with empathy and compassion for one another and their descent into nihilism and cold-heartedness and apathy. And I, I, I read this play at the suggestion of a teacher of mine a couple years ago, and I immediately made a connection and said, this looks really similar to what I'm seeing today because it's the story about these young people who are, are losing their empathy and, their, and kind of giving way into nihilism. And in turn, the author didn't know this at the time, but obviously if this is a picture of what the generation at the time looked like, it explains a bit what allowed Hitler and his, uh, his regime to come to power, rising through a wave of apathy via young people. And I'm looking at today the kind of sociopolitical climate in the U.S. as well as other countries, and I'm looking at uh, the picture of what young people are doing today. And obviously it's not one-to-one, -one, but I see frightening similarities that make me say, oh, I, this is a story worth telling right now because hopefully it can start a conversation that we, uh, will allow us to prevent the mistakes of yesteryear to come back and haunt us. Uh, Mark Twain said something that I really love, which is history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> that's great. And I think that that's a, a good way of looking at how I want to work with theater in this play in particular is that this is something where I'm seeing a rhyming scheme showing up that I'd like to avoid if possible. Right. How, are you doing anything to the script to, uh, in your concept to update it or to draw those parallels more clearly for a present day audience or are you just going to address that maybe in director's notes 
it'll primarily be, I think, true to the time period, but there are little ways in which I'm thinking about um, making it clear to an audience that this is not just a story of stuck in the past. Um, I've been looking into a lot of Brechtian methods to try and take the audience out of the moment and remind them that they are watching a play in hopes that that will, rather than giving them that catharsis that we talked about earlier, that will uh, trigger a conversation after the evening of theater has concluded um, and it'll allow people to go home and kind of grapple with themselves and with each other. Uh, so little, little elements um, right now, one that I'm playing with is music. The difference, you know, music plays a big part in this play and you can tell when a piece of music is out of place. And so I'm experimenting with how I can use music to remind an audience that, oh, this is, this is not just in the 1920s. This could happen anytime. Now for something completely different. I know that you shared an interest when you were in high school uh, with between theater and also being an athlete. You were in track, right? Cross were, country. Cross country. Cross country, yeah. Oh my God. I, could, I couldn't so do it's, track. So it's, it's running, like running, running, and running. What did that what did that do? I'm always fascinated with people who, who can do that and why they do it and what they get out of that kind of long distance running. Cause I think it's a real specific type of activity. Yeah. Uh, well, I got a lot out of my four years of cross country in high school. Um, one major thing I got out of it that I didn't really appreciate fully at the time was the discipline that it gave me, the ability to do something that was demanding and exhausting and strenuous, but knowing that every day getting a little better, getting a little better, working through pain, working through difficulty, ultimately with an end goal in mind. Um, that was something that I really cultivated over those four years that has honestly helped make me the worker and the artist that I am today. Because one of my bedrocks and of philosophy is doing the work and working hard and making it happen one way or another. So I really owe that to my high school cross country coach, uh, coach Kedge and the discipline he instilled in us. And another thing that I just loved about it in the moment was the thrill because practices were exhausting and draining and, and you, there were days where it was hot and you were in pain or feeling sick, but on every Friday or Saturday we had a race and there was something about the rawness of competing with the 50 people around you in a test of pure will that was really exhilarating for me. And, and, and some of my favorite moments that I've had in my life have been um, the last 200 meters of a race where I'm in a pack of three or four guys and we're all just hungry and to, willing to see who is willing to suffer more to, to win at the end of the day. And, it, and it, obviously that's not a philosophy that I would apply to all things in my life because it can be dangerous, but with something... <laughs> purely physical it's really exhilarating and it also has the added benefit of keeping me in good physical shape right so now that I, it's very exciting that you're going off into this you know lovely land of directing and finishing school and starting ultimately you know life and a career after school oh boy um, and I, you know, I know that you're going to probably be in other parts of the country, maybe even, you know, overseas eventually working. Um, but what, as a New Mexican, because I consider you a New Mexican now, what, what do you like about New Mexico? What do you identify with? And, and when you go out into the world, um, what little piece of New Mexico do you carry with you? Oh, let me start. Let me let me give you a start in reverse here, uh, both literally and uh, spiritually. What do I carry with me? I um I literally have a little uh, necklace that is comprised of charms, silver and turquoise that have been made by local native craftsmen that I have over the years kind of built up a collection of because it's something that I always I always wear unless I am forced to for a physical activity. Uh, so it's been on me pretty much 24 seven for several years now. That's just a way of keeping a piece of home close to my heart. As far as spiritually and the things that I, that I look to New Mexico to, to guide me with, there is a culture of appreciation here of little things, finding beauty in little things that a lot of other people from other places might not see. And, and, and a, a laid back attitude that's not lazy, but that is a little bit of letting the world 
run the way that it will and finding your place within that rather than having to bend over backwards to make something happen. Um, obviously living in New York and the way that I do, I kind of forget that a lot of the time, but it's nice to come back and remind myself of that because the culture here is so willing to see beauty in little things and things that other people would call ugly that I called ugly when I first moved here, uh, eight years ago, something like that, you know, cactuses in the middle of, in the middle of an arroyo or, or an adobe house that seems very basic at first but when you realize that the sunset hits it at just the right angle on certain days it glows little things like that have made me appreciate and look for beauty in all the little things thank you alec we wish you a terrific terrific year thank you for having me